Fresh 102.7. We're Carson and Kane on Fresh 102.7, and we are the luckiest people in the whole wide world because we have Lucas Graham and his amazing band just in from Denmark last night. Uh, well, two days ago. Two days ago. Yeah. And you're going back tonight. So, you know, seven years is is absolutely huge right now, and we're so happy to have you guys here. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Our yeah. first American radio interview we're pretty wow. stoked. Yes. <laughs> remember what we talked about we got to mess with them a little bit okay. <laughs> we use some words they don't know and stuff like that yeah you got you call these are your boys right your Those band is your boys, boys. You, yeah. you've known them uh, for the better part of your life or yeah after a while mark and i actually had a folk music band 10 years ago <laughs> yeah. uh, wow we <laughs> playing irish, irish folk, folk songs music. yeah <laughs> weren't you in a choir as well what? Like a boys' choir, weren't you in a choir? Yes, I am a classically educated soprano soloist. Oh, nice. <laughs> and you know, Both, well, like that's, fancy. It's yeah. good I wasn't born in like the 17th century or they would have schnipped me. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even need it. So you're, you're ahead of the game. <laughs> we also notice a little. Uh, <laughs> that's okay, they won't get at it. <laughs> it's okay, feel free. <laughs> um, there's rap. We det I detect rap too. You have a really extensive background. In yes, your music. yes, yes. Um, we kind of been around the world and back in terms of figuring out how to sound and how to how to angle the songs and the music. Like the drums are very Dr. Dre-ish, very rap driven. You could say the bass is very James Jameson '50s '60s, and the keyboard is very Casper. <laughs> Oh, yeah, please introduce the band. I'm sorry, well, guys. We've got Casper, the friendly ghost on keys. <laughs> we also call him Master of the Mills, but that's a whole different story. We've got Stick Mr. Lovestick right here on the drums, and we've got Mr. Magnum on, and he goes deep on the bass. Nice. Take us back to, to where you grew up. Reading your bio, I found this very interesting. You, you know, you grew up in Copenhagen, but is that the right way to say it or Copenhagen? Copenhagen. Okay. Copenhagen would be oh, the German way. I was trying, to be, fancy I was trying too. to be fancy and backfired. So, but you grew up in this little smaller part of it that was uh, sort of down, right? I guess. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a squatted army base that got squatted in 1971, and it has been pretty much autonomously run ever since. Um, yeah, so I was born in an area with no policing, no street lights, no cars. No policing? Well, they so come people running crazy? And no, no, no. We have a rule in our neighborhood that you can do whatever you want as long as you don't inhibit other people in doing what they want. And that worked? Well, wow. it works pretty well. Like, if there's a fight, you can be subpoenaed to a women's meeting. So that means you and me, we've been in a fight. So we okay. have to sit on stage and all the women from our community, that's 350 of them, are sitting in the audience. Oh, no. So Judging? your mom and my mom are going to be like... Why did you get in a fight, boys? <gasps> he drank my beer. Well, couldn't you just bought a new beer? It's three bucks, son. Come on. And suddenly you're you're being you you can be forced into like community labor and, and stuff. By your mother? <laughs> yes, by the women in the neighborhood. Well, I you can't love hit a society women. where women judge you and rule you. That's awesome. It should well, be like that in this country this right is, now. Oh my gosh, it kind of is, <laughs> but that's way more formal. Did you all grow up in Christiana? Nope. No, no, no. <laughs> we grew up in different parts of Copenhagen. Yeah, they were afraid of Christiania until they met me. Yeah, and you like, brought them in there. When you grow up in Copenhagen, your parents always tell you that Christiania is like a, a dangerous place. You shouldn't go there. So I've never really been until I met Lucas and we started playing out there and we actually saw this great place. Yeah. Well, it's like a project, just a very pretty ghetto. <laughs> Lots of flowers, lots of trees, but we still like throw Molotov cocktails at the police officers <laughs> once in a while. So but it's, you uh, take pride in them. They're yes. very nice and well made. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> big, big, nice wine bottles. You have to get the, the, like, the gas and the ether dose oh, right. <laughs> Make sure that the cotton strip goes about. down deep enough into the... So. It doesn't take long to learn how to make them. So I guess you haven't been in trouble with the law before, if there is no law. I have not been caught. Ah. <laughs> That's the difference. And that is what makes a crook and a lawyer. That like, who, some of them get caught and the lawyers don't. All right. Yeah. So uh, what was your childhood like? I mean, when you weren't getting in trouble making Molotov cocktails. Um, <clears throat> is your family musical? How'd you get into it? Yes, my mom is actually a music teacher at like a, a school for kids with learning disabilities. My father was Irish, so that, that kind of goes without saying we were musical. A lot of singing, a lot of uh, poems, a lot of instruments in the family, generally speaking. 
my aunt sings in a Bulgarian women's choir. I don't know why, but it's great, actually. <laughs> And uh, yeah, just singing, writing songs. I started writing rap when I was 12, started writing songs when I was 20. And uh, Do you I actually wrote some of my first songs in New York seven years ago when I was 20. I stayed for a month here on my own. Wow. Yeah. That got you writing. That was, was one of the reasons why I just kept writing, I think. Can you tell us about seven years? What, what motivated you for that song? Tell us about that song. Well, we have a producer called Ristorp, um, and he... He feeds you melodies without you noticing it. So he was sitting on the piano one day. We'd been writing in our studio. We've got a huge studio in Copenhagen. And we're writing, and I kind of got sick and tired of, of all the guys, and we couldn't really get anywhere. So I went and laid on the couch out in the, in the big kitchen we got. And then suddenly Ristorp is sneaking out into the kitchen and starts playing the piano. Do, 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 do. And he's kind of just like, hmm, 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 hmm. And he just keeps playing this riff and just kind of hums the melody until I'm suddenly like singing lyrics to it. And I actually thought I made up that melody, but it was actually Ristorp. <laughs> Is there a reason why you uh, stopped at 60? Yeah, my father passed away at 61. So my like gender role, it doesn't go further. Um, it's a bit weird to explain, but it's as if I can't really imagine myself being older than my father was. No, that's not weird. I can see that. Yeah. So I kind of need to get to that breaking point before I myself believe in the fact that I can be older than him. Like You'll imagine say. the day when you're suddenly older than your father and you're like, I'm actually physically older than my father ever was. Huh, who'd seen that coming? <laughs> and then you realize what he meant when he was all, because my dad did the same thing. He would always talk about, oh, I don't feel this old. I don't feel this old. And then yeah. when you finally get there, you're like, now I know what he meant. Yeah. You know, like where, where, where'd that spot come from? Well, dad, you're old. And now we're all going to get there. <laughs> Yeah, but the whole song was kind of, it started out a little more like a motivational song and it just ended up becoming so personal. I think we wrote 10 or 12 verses and started moving them around and figuring out how do we get the progression right. And it just, it took like six hours and we had it basically written and done. And it was a very emotional moment. Like that song is the reason why we got our publishing deal with Warner Chapel and why we successively got uh, to do showcases here in New York at SOBs and in LA in 2013, which got us our record deal with Warner Records. So it's like that song opened a lot of opportunities for us. So I'm, I'm really happy that Ristorp lured me into writing it. <laughs> Especially if it happened in six hours, you know you have a hit. It's making a huge impact um, worldwide, really. Um, Adele right now I think has is number one everywhere but in three countries because you guys are number one there wow. on iTunes. So we I think it's head. iTunes. I'm not sure if it's exactly iTunes. I think it's Spotify. Spotify, okay. Northern is, Europe, it's... nobody buys music anymore. Like literally, if you want to be number one on the sales charts, you need to sell four copies a day. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> well, you've, you've way surpassed that. Yeah. So you've done very well in all of Europe. Is there anything that you've uh, splurged on yet or no? I just bought a Michelin restaurant, actually. <laughs> That's kind of... Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. That was a stupid amount of money. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> that restaurant is not making money, but they make amazing food. <laughs> well, you got to get the word out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we only I'm have 24 advertise. seats in the restaurant. We can, like, it's, it's always packed. <laughs> had you always wanted to own a restaurant? Like, why did you do that? Nah, it's growing up in this very, very diverse neighborhood. It's like, you, you just want to do something. I have my summer house that I'm building up next to my granny's summer house. I bought, I bought basically the forest that we played in as kids. That's awesome. I rebuilt my mom's house after my father passed. And I have my little apartment in the central part of Copenhagen. So I don't... Like, I don't need a Porsche or a Rolex. So I, what do we spend money on? Let's buy a restaurant. Magnus did the same. He opened a restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> it's a burger restaurant. They make the best burgers in Copenhagen. They just won an award for it. Wow. Hmm. So it worked out, the restaurant thing. That's what athletes do here in the United States. Everybody, oh, yeah. they, I don't know what to do with my money. Let's do a restaurant. Well, I'm glad it's working out for you. <laughs> Thank you. What are they called? Mine is called Cadeau, like present in French. His is oh. called sliders. Because we Sli serve sliders. Nice. <laughs> yeah. You nice can and get simple. gold on your French fries. Nice and simple. <laughs> well, your album is, is, is huge in Europe. Um, Mama said, that's an amazing song. Can you tell us about that? The story behind that song? Well, I write a lot of songs about my dead father because it oh. fills a lot of the void in my, uh, in my life. And um, 
a lot of my friends actually, some of the guys I grew up with, they asked me like, hey, but your mom is just as cool as your dad. Like, like my, mom could look, my mom could just look at some of the tough kids in my neighborhood when we were kids and they'd be like, Ava's looking. Oh, just, just stand, just, a just stand. No, some of the guys that grew up in really tough families, they, they would come by our house and have dinner and sleep on the couch and stuff. And my mom never knew that they came to our house because they just like had a beating or something. So she would have this grip on these really tough kids that other parents wouldn't have because she treated them with dignity and respect. She sounds awesome. Oh, she's a great woman. So I, I just had to write a song kind of congratulating my mom on the great work she did. Like the other day she was asking me, son, when have I ever told you all those things you tell me, you <laughs> write about that I've been saying to you? And I'm like, mom, it's called poetic license. I can make up whatever I want. If it rhymes, and it's people going in. will believe it. <laughs> <laughs> now look, at, you've written, you write a lot about serious things, but there's also a fun side to you guys and a risque side, maybe, to you guys. We like strip clubs. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the songs on the album that are a little bit fun? Well, we've got drunk in the morning, right? Yeah. That's uh, we were in the studio one night and we had no women in the studio, single men, and. Um, Alcohol was involved. Blood started rushing to the wrong head. <laughs> and we agreed that to get women into the studio, we must write the most perfectly written booty call song. <laughs> so we wrote, when I'm drunk in the morning, I'm calling you, you might be lonely. That's so eloquent. <laughs> oh yeah, that'll work. Well, first verse is... <laughs> Does that work? I was gonna no, ask. <laughs> imagine me calling up, girl, it's I got direct. one question. Are you still awake? Awake enough for me to see you. Well, when you Please sing it just like that. Listen. I might change my mind. Yes, I know it's late, but better late right, than I'm never. In. <laughs> yeah, that would work. <laughs> and we wrote a song about a lyrics. stripper. <laughs> yes, I want to hear this story. Tell the stripper story. It's, actually, it's a good one. It's actually Lovestick and I who we fell in love. <laughs> yeah. Lovestick? Yeah. Okay, That's my just name. check it. <laughs> yeah, that, is, that is his name, don't wear it out. I'm not. And uh, we were in the body shop on Sunset Boulevard. We were drunk and we looked at it and said, I've seen this in Entourage. We can go in there. It will be good. And we went in and we met this amazing stripper. She was so brown and round and big and she had very big eyes. eyes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a, a very, very tight, 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 tight little... Ponytail. Ponytail. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we went out of that strip club very, very poor. We had no, I think we spent like a thousand dollars. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> and we basically went back to the same strip club a week later and she's not there. But we meet her coworker, Precious. <laughs> and Precious tells us that Megan, as her name was, maybe it was her stripper name, we're never going to find her. Well, Megan had stopped working because she graduated as a nurse. She's now working in, in, a, in a hospital in LA, so like, that's pretty cool, but we don't care really because we wanted to see her dance again. We don't have time breaking bones and running around like all the emergency rooms of L Los Angeles trying to find Megan, who might not be called Megan. <laughs> no, right. Who, she went legit. She wasn't coming back. Like, that was her called, performer name, Megan? I know, it's so I'm sweet, not, that's right? That's right, that's like maybe a real like name. Yeah, like, well, what, maybe her name was Trixie by birth and she's like, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna extract the urine out of everybody and call myself Megan on the pole. <laughs> But we agreed that it was a funny story to write the song about the girl that stopped stripping because everybody wants to hear that, that story of strippers making it out. Like everybody likes to hear a success story. Kids getting out of the projects, Megan getting off the pole, not wearing clear heels anymore. Her father <laughs> didn't do a complete mess of it anyway. But <laughs> we just wanted to see her dance again. And because we have really bad strip clubs in Denmark, so it might be a huge compliment to you guys if you ever find out that a stripper is using one of your songs as she dances. I think we need a couple more 808s before they play our stuff at the body shop. <laughs> yeah. So what are you guys doing for the holidays? What is um, uh, Christmas or whatever you celebrate like in Denmark? Like, is there any kind of cool tradition? We um, have Christmas trees. We, we dance around and we have little packages under. It's actually from our part of the world. The Christmas tree originates. From Germany. Germany, mm -hmm. Denmark, Scandinavia. How do you say uh, Merry Christmas in Danish? Oh, this is going to be fun. Yeah. Glædelig jul. Okay, one more time. Glædelig jul. Watch Glædelig how he does that and try that. 
Gladly Jul. <laughs> Gladly Jul. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was, that was pretty good. <laughs> that was so funny. Only five and a half million people speak our language. We've got this little secret thing. <laughs> yeah, it's so fun. You could be on the on the subway and no one would know. <laughs> are you no guys going to Are you guys going to buy each other gifts? What would you guys get each other? Vinyl for you. <laughs> I just destroyed your football, so I might buy, buy you a new one. <laughs> I might buy Marcus Stripper. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Casper, you're, you're getting too old for that stuff, aren't you? <laughs> wine? Yeah. Wine. Oh, a simple. I will get you some Italian some wine. Some good, uh, like, c cooking books and stuff like that. I'm going to get you Delia Smith. That's it's very grown thick, up. I know. <laughs> it's real, man. Yeah. It is. He's the only grown up in the band, if you can tell. I know, because he asked for a wine. Yes. It's very sophisticated. And he has facial hair. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Well, so, yeah. <laughs> Well, we're really glad you guys could come by. Thanks Lucas for having Graham, us. Lucas Graham, great fans, great performers. Uh, we are looking forward to the album next year, and please come back and teach us more Danish and hang out with us here at Fresh. Thank you for having us. Thanks, guys. Uh -huh.